My name is Lewis Bramblett, and I'm a volunteer researcher for the Stanley County Historical Society. For the past six and a half years, I've been managing the website for the Historical Society and the Facebook page for the Stanley County History Center. During this time, I've been able to research and share over 1,500 different stories on the Facebook page. I've had several books and a number of booklets published on our local history that are available at the History Center gift shop. I have written short articles about the history of our buildings, businesses, and people of Stanley County for the Stanley News and Press since 2016. Finally, I have helped with the production of a number of short videos on Alamoral history that will be available in the near future. Today I'm going to share an expanded version of a presentation I did several years ago called They Did What? And I'll be sharing stories about people with connections to Stanley County. There are a number of people with connections to Stanley County with well-known accomplishments. In the business world, Eddie Crutchfield was the head of banking giant First Union, Bill Grigg led Duke Power, and Sharon Harris was the head of Carolina Power and Light. Other well-known people include Woody Durham, who was the announcer for the University of North Carolina sports teams for many years, Bob Harris was the voice of the Duke Blue Devils, and of course we can't forget country music singer and reality TV star Kelly Pickler. These people have some wonderful and impressive accomplishments, but today I'm going to share stories of people who have done interesting or unusual things that may not be as well known. Jake Price was born March 16, 1921 in Monroe, North Carolina. He graduated from Monroe High School and spent time at Winkett Junior College before enlisting in the Army during World War II. When he returned to the United States, Price graduated from Winkett and then later served in an administrative role at a hospital in Asheville. He next became just the third hospital administrator at the Stanley County Hospital when he was hired in 1955, and he served in that position until 1962. When Price left Albemarle in June of 1962, he first became the Associate Hospital Administrator and in January of 1963 was appointed the Administrator of Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. In November of 1963, Price was faced with the incredibly challenging task of managing the hospital through the turmoil of the assassination of President John Kennedy. After they were shot in Dealey Plaza, President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly were brought into Parkland. Just two days later, Lee Harvey Oswald was brought into the hospital after he had been shot by Jack Ruby. A few days after all the events were over, Price sent a letter to all of the hospital employees. It's an interesting recap of what happened. In the letter he pointed out that during the events, Parkland had served as the temporary seat of government of the United States and had become the temporary seat of the government of the state of Texas. The hospital was the site of the death of the 35th president and the site of the ascendancy of the 36th president. With the death of both President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, it had twice become the center of attention of the entire world, while at the same time, it had continued to function at close to normal pace as a large charity hospital. Price closed the letter by praising the hard work and professionalism of all the hospital employees and staff. William Whitley was born in 1775 in what is now the Locust area of Stanley County. Late in life, he would tell stories about being a young child and that he remembered soldiers returning from the fighting of the Revolutionary War. In 1887, Whitley attended a July 4th celebration at Rocky River Springs near Aquadale. Due to him being 112 years old at the time, stories about this event made newspapers as far away as San Francisco. At his death in 1890, at age 115, Whitley was believed to be the oldest person in the United States. Having been born prior to the Declaration of Independence, he was considered the last surviving subject of King George III of England to have been born on American soil. William Whitley is buried at the George Barbie Cemetery in Cabarrus County. In the Aquadale area was a man named Joshua Hudson. He lived to be 99 years old and had quite a large family. Late in life, he was known to have had 23 children, 105 grandchildren, and at least 200 great-grandchildren. According to an article in the Southern Vedette newspaper from 1891, he never took drugs from a doctor, never was drunk, 
never saw a railroad, never saw a sewing machine, never saw a cook stove, never bought a bushel of grain, and never attended court as a witness or otherwise. As unusual as this may seem, his story does get a little more interesting. One of Joshua Hudson's daughters was Jane Swearingen. In August of 1956, she was featured in the Ripley's Believe It or Not comic strip that was published in newspapers all over the country. The comic states, Mrs. Jane Swearingen of Albemarle, North Carolina, and her father had between them lived during the administration of every president of the United States. The father, Joshua Hudson, born 1796 when Washington was president, lived to the age of 99 and had 23 children. Mrs. Swearingen was born in 1874 when her father was 78 years old. At the time this was in the newspapers, in just two generations, Swearingen and her father had lived through the administrations of the first 34 presidents. When Mrs. Swearingen passed away in 1967, this unusual feat had been extended through Lyndon Johnson, the 36th president. There was once a veterinarian in Albemarle, Dr. William Harward, who for a time was partners with his next door neighbor, Dr. E. M. Martin. Dr. Martin had a daughter, Murtis, who during World War II left Albemarle to work in Washington, D.C. One evening while waiting on a bus, she met Dawes Butler, who she later married. Dawes later had quite an interesting career. He was a voice actor and worked for Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera at their company, Hanna Barbera. Some of Dawes more well-known characters included Quick Draw McGraw, Captain Crunch, and Yogi Bear. Now I'm sure you're wondering what this has to do with Dr. Harward. According to Dawes and Murtis's son Charles, back before they were married, his dad would come to Albemarle to visit Murtis. Before Dawes could get to the door of her house, Dr. Harward, who if you remember lived next door, would ask him to come over and talk. Dr. Harward had a distinctive southern accent that Dawes remembered a number of years later when he created the voice for Huckleberry Hound. Hanna-Barbera later tried to claim that the voice was modeled after Andy Griffith, but Griffith didn't really become well known until after Huckleberry Hound was introduced, and the Butler family has always maintained that Dr. Harward was the true inspiration. Over the years, there have been numerous people with connections to Stanley County who have been associated with Duke University and its predecessor school, Trinity College. Sports announcer Bob Harris, mentioned earlier, and All-American football player Bear Knotts are two of the more well-known. The story that isn't as well-known, however, is that there is a building at Duke University that is named for someone from Albemarle. Joseph Bivens was one of the sons of John Bivens. John owned a cabinet shop on 2nd Street in Albemarle and at one time served as the mayor. J.D. Bivens, another one of John's sons, was an editor with several newspapers here in town for many years. Joseph graduated from Trinity College at the top of his class in 1896. He spent a year teaching in Roxboro, then spent a year as principal of the Albemarle Academy here in town. He received his license to preach in 1898, and due to his excellent reputation, he was hired as the first headmaster of the new Trinity Park High School that year. During his time as headmaster, the school did extremely well. Most of his students went on to college, and the majority of them chose to attend Trinity College. Joseph was married to one of his college classmates, Fanny Carr, on September 1, 1904. When they graduated, he had just barely beaten her out for the honor of being valedictorian. After the wedding ceremony, they left immediately for Virginia Beach and spent just a couple of days there. On their return to Durham by train, when they were almost home, Fanny was asleep while Joseph received permission from the conductor to smoke a cigar on the rear platform of the train. While he was gone, the train failed to make it up a hill, so was backing up to try again. The conductor noticed a hat fly by the window, and when he looked out, he saw Joseph laying on the side of the tracks. When they reached him, he was dead. No one else had been on the back of the train, so the exact cause of his fall was never determined. Joseph had been extremely popular, so when a new dorm was built at Trinity Park High School in 1905, it was named Bivens Hall in his honor. The high school was closed in 1922 and the property was incorporated into Trinity College. A few years later, Trinity was renamed Duke University. Bivens Hall has had many uses over the years and is still a part of Duke University today. 
At 7.10 a.m. on Thursday, July 20th, 1972, 16-year-old Albemarle resident Mark Lauder entered the pool at Rock Creek Park. His goal was to break the world record for treading water. At the time, the current record recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records was 17 and a half hours. During Lauder's time in the pool, he had plenty of company from family and friends. He was given drinks and was fed by fellow lifeguards from the diving board. As he got closer to the record, a TV was set up by the pool for him to watch in order to help pass the time. Lauder officially left the pool at 1.10 a.m. on Friday, July 21st, 1972, having treaded water for a full 18 hours. Soon after his adventure, Lauder and his family contacted the Guinness Book of World Records, and his 18 hours treading water in the pool was officially recognized as a new record. His name was included in the next edition of the book. Mark Lauder later obtained his law degree from the University of Miami and has been an attorney in Albemarle for many years. Milton Irwood, who was the first preacher at First Presbyterian Church in Albemarle, had a son named Wallace. Wallace has the distinction of being one of three members of the very first graduating class from the Albemarle Graded School that was the first public school in Stanley County. After graduation, Arrowwood left Albemarle to attend the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. He did pretty well at the academy and graduated 21st in a class of 62 cadets in 1904. Arrowwood's first assignment was to the battleship Kearsarge that was the flagship of the North Atlantic Squadron. This was considered an excellent post as he very likely could have been assigned to a training ship or a gunboat in the Far East. After about a year on the Kearsarge, Arrowwood submitted his resignation, even though prior to entering the Naval Academy, he had signed a contract that stated he would serve for eight years. Due to the fact that he had not fulfilled the full eight years, the Secretary of the Navy declined to accept his resignation. One day while on leave, Arrowwood decided not to return to the ship. The Navy enlisted the help of the Secret Service, and they found him working at a brokerage house in Brooklyn. Arrowwood was returned to his ship, where he was put on trial and convicted of desertion. He had now become the first graduate of the United States Naval Academy to be convicted of desertion. Now back briefly to Arrowwood's father. During the time Wallace was at the Naval Academy, the Reverend Arrowwood had periodically complained to the Navy that his son should be allowed to attend a nearby Presbyterian church. The Navy refused this request, stating that the midshipman could only attend the chapel at the Academy. After Airwood was convicted of desertion, his father used this refusal as part of his appeal that eventually reached President Teddy Roosevelt. Reverend Airwood felt that the Navy had failed his son by not allowing him to worship at a place of his choosing. The Reverend had hoped that Roosevelt would at least consider changing his son's conviction from desertion to absent without leave. Roosevelt let the desertion charge stand, so Wallace was discharged from the Navy and lost his citizenship. During the rest of his life, Arrowwood lived in a number of different states. He was married twice and might have been married to both women at the same time. At one point, while living in Chicago, he wrote books on large refrigeration equipment, and at another point, he owned a business that sold buggies and then later motorcycles in Atlanta. In 1971, an Albemarle High School student named Brad Perry made national news. Along with the help of his father, they constructed a plywood and metal mock-up of an Apollo Command module. Perry's goal was to enter the module at the beginning of one of the upcoming NASA Apollo missions, and he would spend the entire time in his module while the real astronauts were in space. Perry was very meticulous in the planning of his mission. His command module was built to exact NASA specifications. A seamstress was hired to create a uniform that would match what the astronauts would be wearing. The only thing that would be different for Brad was that his mother would prepare food since his command module didn't have a way to store food. His mother did, however, follow NASA guidelines in food preparation. In July of 1971, Perry was featured on a segment of the CBS Evening News. He was interviewed by a local reporter where he told about the plans for his mission. There's another spaceman going through the countdown you haven't heard of. He's 16-year-old Brad Perry, and his trip is taking off from Albemarle, North Carolina, where C.J. Underwood of WBTV Charlotte reports. 
The word from Cape Kennedy is that three Americans are going to the moon, but that is not entirely correct. A fourth American, in his own way, will join Scott, Warden, and Irwin for the flight of Apollo 15. He is 16-year-old Brad Perry. Here he is in the final hours of preparation. By now, there is little he does not know of the mission that lies ahead. Months ago, it seemed like a mission impossible. Now it is becoming an achievement incredible. Brad Perry and his father have constructed in the basement of their Albemarle home a simulator that duplicates in remarkable detail the Apollo command module. Two years and more than $2,000, most saved from Brad's paper route, have been poured into the project. NASA's polo tan simulation colors were applied by three professional painters, a local seamstress custom-made Brad's spacesuit. Only after placing our shoes in the commander's footlocker were we allowed inside. Every system is represented in Brad's mock-up, even the CO2 absorber cartridge access panel. This is a canister which, chemically on the real command module, uh, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and puts oxygen back into it for the crew to breathe and thus recycling the same air throughout the cabin over and over again. How often do they have to do that? About once every 12 hours for the total mission. Now you could have just left that panel over there as is and not had anything behind it. Why did you go to such detail? Because this is one of the details called out in the flight plan that you need to be able to duplicate to make a realistic simulation. And Brad intends to do just that. As Scott, Warden, and Irwin enter Apollo 15, Brad will enter his simulator, close the forward access hatch, and stay there for the duration of the 12-day flight. And a very patient mother will help keep him alive. Who's going to be responsible for seeing that you get all this on a regular basis? Well, I've gone over this extensively with my mother, and she knows how to bag everything, whether it's a, a wet pack made out of aluminum, whether it's a wide or narrow, um, cellophane bag and she knows just exactly what to prepare when. We've got the exact menu that the Apollo astronauts in space will be using. So this is exact and what you see here, the chicken chocolate milk tang and sugar cookies is a direct menu, um, uh, the space menu prepared for the Apollo astronauts on the moon. A hatch on the other side will be used for waste disposal. Brad's sleeping pad will keep him anchored to the wall, exactly like the astronauts. He will always be in contact with radio and television accounts of the Apollo flight through his earphones. The man who claims he has been the North American Rockwell of the project is Raleigh Perry, Brad's father. Did you ever think it would grow to this magnitude? Uh, I never did. I didn't start out believing it would be there, and it just got this way because Brad says, Dad, it, it isn't finished yet we got to do a little more. We've got to add this, we've got to add that. And he had all of this information from NASA to go by. And trying to make the boy see, see his dream fulfilled, this is it. Now the countdown is really on. The seat is going in for a test. There is a man in Houston, flight operations technician Robert Arnold, who was here last summer to see what Brad was doing. He has given Brad every piece of material relating to Apollo 15, including the flight plan. Without any question, the most remarkable project that I've ever seen a young man undertake on his own like this. The spacecraft configuration, when I saw it, was still in, in its construction stage, but even at that point, it was just unbelievable uh, what Brad had put into the project and the understanding he had of the spacecraft systems and the related procedures. And 16-year-old Brad Perry insists he will not be bored during his 12-day simulated flight because I'll be too busy. You do want to be an astronaut, I assume. Yes, sir, if it's at all possible, and if not, I'd like to work as closely associated with the astronauts as possible. If you could go to the moon today, would you? Yes, sir, this is why I'm doing this. So as you marvel at the accomplishments of Apollo 15, consider what 16-year-old Brad Perry has done right here in the basement of his home. The simulated flight he is taking says a great deal about why man indeed has reached the moon. C.J. Underwood reporting in Albemarle, North Carolina. Due to the challenges of trying to get everything exact, and also with the added pressure of the publicity he received prior to his mission, Perry was not able to follow along with the entire Apollo 15 mission. He did complete the full mission with the Apollo 16 astronauts the next year. Even though Perry didn't become an astronaut, he did have a long career with NASA and was involved with a wide range of programs. Recently, the command module built by Brad Perry and his father was on display at the Stanley County History Center, and Brad gave a number of programs to area residents. Robert Griffin was born in Albemarle, but grew up and went to school in New London. 
He later graduated from the University of North Carolina in 1965. According to his sister, he worked for the United States Health Department for a year or two before entering the Air Force. He then spent about four years in the Air Force. He worked in intelligence and was primarily located at the Pentagon. While serving with the Air Force, he was chosen to serve as a military social aide at the White House under President Richard Nixon. According to the White House website, White House military social aides serve as an extension of the President and First Lady in their roles as official host and hostess of the United States. Their job is to help important dignitaries at White House parties, dinners, and other functions to be sure they have an enjoyable experience. After leaving the military, Griffin spent many years with Prudential Life Insurance in their corporate insurance area. He and his wife had two sons, and they lived in several cities around the country. Lou Donaldson was born in 1926 in Baden. He first started playing clarinet at age nine. Later, during the early 1940s, he went to college at North Carolina A&T State University and was drafted into the Navy in 1944. It was while in the military that he began playing the alto sax. After Donaldson was discharged from the Navy, he returned to North Carolina to finish school. He continued to play in clubs all around the state. At the urging of a fellow musician, he moved to New York in 1950, where he began to play in clubs in Harlem. Donaldson's career began to take off, and over the following decades, he recorded in a number of different genres. In 2007, we were honored to have Donaldson perform at the Stanley County Agri-Civic Center during the Albemarle Sesquicentennial Celebration. Donaldson has been presented with many awards during his career. Some of these awards include being inducted into the International Jazz Hall of Fame in 1996, being inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame in 2012, and being given the Jazz Master Award by the National Endowment for the Arts in 2013. According to the NEA, the Jazz Master Award is the highest honor our nation bestows to a jazz artist. Donaldson is one of the last surviving bebop era jazz musicians, and during his career, he played with other well-known artists such as Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, Miles Davis, and many others. <laughs>